Now with all the latest from around the world and here at home, it's the ITV News at 10. After months of denials, he finally admitted it. Yes, all right, the Prime Minister said he had attended a party in the first lockdown, but he'd honestly thought it was a work event. I know the rage they feel with me and with the government I lead when they think that in Downing Street itself, the rules are not being properly followed. But even amongst former supporters, the reaction was often brutal. Why didn't he have the guts to do this before? Because he's just been caught. Because he's been caught? Exactly, Margaret, yeah. yeah. And tonight, the storm clouds have been building as more Tory MPs have concluded enough is enough. I don't want to be in this position, but I am in the position now where I don't think he can continue as leader of the Conservatives. Of course, most of us understand it's all too easy to confuse our workplace for a party. Happens all the time. But is this defence really going to hold? And crucially, did he have any prior knowledge of the event itself? We'll be looking at his explanation in forensic detail, but also at the numbers involved in the rebellion. Also on News at 10 tonight. A major royal crisis, as Andrew is told, the sex abuse case against him in America is heading for trial. The true impact of the staffing crisis, Emily has a report from the NHS frontline on the price of COVID absences and surely the big story of the week. They have finally come up with onions that do not make you cry. This is ITV News at 10 with Tom Bradby. Good evening. Flushed out by an email leaked to us inviting Downing Street staff to a bring your own booze party during the very first lockdown, the Prime Minister finally faced MPs today. He brought his own line in apology and remorse and a key admission. Yes, he did spend 25 minutes at a party in his own back garden in May 2020. To barely suppress laughter, he told MPs he thought it was a work event, so not a party at all. That prompted derision from opposition benches. The leaders of Labour, the SNP and indeed the Lib Dems all called on him to resign. Later, so too did the leader of his own Scottish Conservatives. Among that group, uh, many did the same. And to trigger a leadership election, 50 15% of Conservative MPs, currently 54 of them, have to submit letters. There are not that many yet. So has acknowledging the rage the public feel towards him and his regret that he didn't do things differently that night done enough? As the sun rose in Downing Street this morning, what light would today finally shed on what truly happened here? After 48 hours, at last Boris Johnson emerged to face that question, his premiership dependent on his answer. As he travelled to Parliament to explain himself to the Commons and the country. A near silent audience listened to what needed to be the performance of his career. Mr Speaker, I want to apologise. I know that millions of people across this country have made extraordinary sacrifices over the last 18 months and I know the rage they feel with me and with the government I lead when they think that in Downing Street itself the rules are not being properly followed. And it turns out we thought right. After weeks of denials, the Prime Minister admitted that he did go to a garden party mid-lockdown he just didn't think it was one. When I went into that garden just after six on the 20th of May 2020 to thank groups of staff before going back into my office 25 minutes later to continue working, I believed implicitly that this was a work event. But Mr Speaker, with hindsight, I should have sent everyone back inside and I should have recognised that even if it could be said technically to fall within the guidance, there would be millions and millions of people 
who simply would not see it that way. Among them, the leader of the opposition. Well, there we have it. After months of deceit and deception, yeah. the pathetic spectacle of a man who's run out of road. Yeah. His defence, his defence, that he didn't realise he was at a party. <laughs> it, it, it is so ridiculous that it's actually offensive to the British public. Yeah. Yes. Is he now going to do the decent thing and resign? Yeah. Uh, I, I, want to, I want to repeat that uh, I thought it was a, a work event. Downing Street claims the Prime Minister never got this email, leaked to ITV News on Monday, which called that work event socially distanced drinks, with staff invited to make the most of the lovely weather in the garden and to bring their own booze. In what other line of employment would you be invited to bring your own booze to a work meeting? Well, you're making all sorts of suppositions about the various different claims and questions well, that's that, have been in the raised, email. that have been raised, and that's precisely why Sue Gray, who's a very senior civil servant, has been tasked to conduct an inve independent investigation. But not everyone's willing to wait. If Theresa May, watching on behind, ever wondered if karma would come back around, well, today some who sit on her side called for Boris Johnson to go. I don't want to be in this position, but I am in the position now where I don't think he can continue as leader of the Conservatives. For now, the Prime Minister returns to number 10, but there is little to toast there tonight. Paul Brandt, News at 10, Westminster. Well, as we've heard, there have been calls for the Prime Minister to resign. That isn't, to be fair, mirrored across the whole of his parliamentary party, but more and more of his MPs do appear to be thinking about it. This evening, they have been weighing up whether what he said today is enough to retain their support. He won the London mayoralty twice. He won the EU referendum. He won the Tory leadership. He won the 2019 election handsomely. What's the the Prime Minister be resigning today? Let's wait to What's the, the Prime Minister. Minister. What do you want the Prime Minister? But as they arrived in Westminster this morning, the big question for all Tory MPs was this. Is Boris Johnson still a winner? Tonight, one former minister told Robert Peston the answer is no. He looks like a liability and I think he either goes now or he goes in three years' time at a general election. And it's up to the party to decide which way round that's going to be. I know my <coughs> thoughts are is that he's damaging us now. He's damaging the entire Conservative brand. Others have reached the same conclusion. We have to say that enough is enough. A red line has been crossed. The information given at the dispatch box was clearly not correct. And when it's time to go, either people go voluntarily and with dignity, or in this case, the 1922 committee will have to take action. But as that backbench committee met tonight, the open rebellion was confined to a handful. Even those who don't really support his leadership seem mostly to be waiting for the full report into Downing Street parties before deciding whether to put pen to paper and try and trigger a vote of confidence. So the Prime Minister does currently seem to have a little of that most precious political commodity, time. But time alone isn't enough. The Prime Minister has a lot more explaining to do to his MPs. I think this is only the start. Um, you know, colleagues will want to see that the Prime Minister has learnt his lesson. They will also want to know uh, exactly how he thought it was a work event when he now accepts it was a party. But some think the Tories should avoid indulging their traditional ruthlessness. I mean, the Tory party changes its leaders like most of us change our socks and appears to think that is going to solve the problem. And of course, a lot of the time, it doesn't solve the problem. When people are talking about a leadership election, they are being totally irresponsible. I mean, profoundly irresponsible. They're not just there to look after the Tory party, they're supposed to be running a country. If that's what Tory MPs hear from their constituencies, perhaps it will stay their hands. But Boris Johnson's premiership is increasingly at the mercy of others. Carl in the News at 10, Westminster. Outfits. Well, he has said sorry, he wishes he, uh, things had been done differently, he takes full responsibility. But Mr Johnson doesn't just need, of course, to convince his MPs, as Carl was saying there. They'll be taking into account the views of their constituents, especially the traditional Conservative voters among them. So did he pass the sincerity test with them? 
Most people had better things to do than watch Boris Johnson squirming in the Commons. But even in the solidly blue surroundings of Solihull... Mr Speaker, I want to apologise. ..loyal Conservative voters were unimpressed when they caught up. I don't trust him anymore. I'm Neither sorry. Neither do I, no. no. There's no trust. No. Why didn't he have the guts to do this before? Because he's just been caught out. Because he's yeah. been caught? Exactly, Margaret, yeah. yeah. The thing is, it should never have happened in the first place, yeah. so, you know, an apology is not going to do anything. Would you vote for him again? No. Mm, I'm not sure, no. I would vote for the party again, yeah. providing he's not our leader. And I understand the anger, the rage that they feel... I don't before. think you do. Uh, Hugh Palmer believes his mother would have taken a similar view of the Prime Minister's words today. Paddy Palmer was a big supporter before she died in August 2020, two months after her twin grandchildren were born. My mum never actually got to hold them, to touch them. She, she saw them through the window. So an apology isn't enough. I want to see, I want to see a, a real difference in the way that politics is conducted and that the way that people who are, you know, in positions of authority and responsibility um, act accordingly. Whatever drinks were enjoyed in Downing Street, it's voters in places like Wakefield who won Boris Johnson the last election. Voters who switched away from Labour and who in this pub now seem ready to switch back. Total hypocritical. I will not vote for him again. It's disgusting. Uh, the guy needs to go. Absolutely. He should go. He's pretty poor, to be honest. He should have either, if you pardon the expression, uh, and then it manned up and just said, look, I've made, we made a mistake, and he should have done that from the start. A Prime Minister's future is always in the voters' hands, but the biggest threat to Boris Johnson is his party sensing he's no longer a winner. Ben Chapman, News at 10. Well, to be fair, that didn't sound particularly promising uh, for the Prime Minister and clearly his problems are not all behind him yet. Let's just uh, discuss this with Paul and then Robert, uh, who is in his studio in a moment. But Paul, maybe I can come uh, to you first. I mean, I feel like a lot of people will be thinking tonight, well, this still leaves rather a lot of questions, does it not? Yeah, and extraordinary scenes today, Tom, but not for the first time. In fact, this is the second occasion on which Boris Johnson has had to stand up in Parliament and apologise in the space of the past month or so. The first time, of course, after we had that footage of Downing Street staff joking about a Christmas party, then today about the garden party. And the apologies haven't been particularly consistent. So the first time around, he said, look, I'm so sorry, I'm so shocked, I'm appalled. I couldn't believe they were joking about it either, but I've been assured nothing was wrong here, that there was no party. And today he's saying, well, there was a party, I just didn't realise it was a party. And there seem to be some pretty major holes in that defence. You know, are we to believe that he stumbled out into the garden, saw dozens of colleagues drinking alcohol, eating picnic food after 6pm on a sunny evening and thought, well, that's not a party, that's a work meeting. And also, how did he know about it? Because we're told that he didn't receive the email that we leaked on Monday. He wasn't part of that email chain. He didn't see that email. So how did he end up in the garden with his colleagues in the first place? Either way, look, he's admitted to being at that party. And by doing so, he hasn't just admitted to arguably the biggest mistake of his political career, but also potentially to a criminal offence. Tonight, the Metropolitan Police are kind of holding the same line. They're not necessarily investigating at this stage, but they're in touch with the Cabinet Office. But you might wonder whether today, look, they got their confession that they need, not just to open a case, but arguably to conclude it pretty quickly. OK, Paul. Uh, well, let's put some of that to, to Robert, um, who's been recording his show tonight. Um, Robert, how do you think the numbers are stacking up? Uh, not brilliantly for the Prime Minister, although this, you know, the, 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 the triggering for a sort of leadership context may yet take some weeks. I mean, what is very striking is that pretty much the only people to come out in support of the Prime Minister from his own party tonight are the members of what's known as the payroll. That's his cabinet, the people that he employs. Uh, very strikingly, the most senior member of that cabinet, Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor, came out last and all he could bring himself to say was that the Prime Minister was right to apologise and people should be patient and wait for the result of the uh, cabinet uh, uh, officials investigation. That's the investigation by Sue Gray. Hardly a ringing endorsement. Uh, I've got 
uh, Nadim Zahawi on my show, the Education Secretary, normally a tremendous loyalist for the Prime Minister. I asked him how uh, this event that looked like a party to most people could possibly be, in the Prime Minister's words, a work event. And he just tied himself up in knots, talking about the number of people employed in Downing Street. But, you know, Paul and I have both looked at the rules uh, in place at the time. It's almost impossible to see how Sue Gray can rule other than that this was a very clear breach of the rules at the time. In the end, though, the person who will judge whether the Prime Minister needs to be uh, punished, uh, whether he should go, is the Prime Minister himself. There's a massive conflict of interest there. Um, and what is also striking is the sheer number of backbenchers who think he should go now. You've just heard from uh, Carl in his piece that Caroline Noakes, again in my show, says he's his continued leadership of the party is damaging the Conservative Party. She thinks he should go now. I've spoken to a number of other uh, Tory MPs. Uh, the consensus among all of them is the Prime Minister, in the words of one, is in absolutely dire trouble. OK, uh, Robert, uh, thank you very much indeed, and do watch Robert's show. Um, always worth watching, but especially tonight, coming up right after this. Now, if the Prime Minister's future seems uncertain tonight, so too does the public and indeed private life of Prince Andrew, the Queen's third son and ninth in line to her throne. He does now face a civil court case in the United States on those sexual abuse allegations made by Virginia Giffray, unless he reaches an out-of-court settlement with her. Before it comes to that, a New York judge refused to throw out her case in what by any yardstick is a tremendous blow for the prince. As we've said many times, Prince Andrew has always denied the claims. Be in no doubt this was a significant setback for Prince Andrew today. His accuser, Virginia Dufresne, here in this now widely seen photo from 2001, called it her pursuit of justice. The prince's legal team, perhaps not surprisingly, has yet to respond. Or anyone else that the lawsuit brought by Ms Dufresne, seen here in 2019, will continue on its legal path. It is a path that leads towards a trial. She is suing Prince Andrew, alleging she was trapped to him for sex on three occasions in 2001. Prince Andrew's lawyer argued he was covered by this document. It is a settlement agreement from 2009 when Jeffrey Epstein paid Virginia Dufresne half a million dollars. In return, she agreed not to take legal action against any other potential defendants. Last week in a New York court, Andrew's team argued he was such a potential defendant. But today the judge ruled he was not. The 2009 agreement, he wrote, cannot be said to demonstrate clearly and unambiguously that the parties intended the instrument directly, primarily or substantially to benefit Prince Andrew. So he decided the defendant, Prince Andrew's motion to dismiss the complaint is denied in all respects. After this ruling, there is no logical stopping point between here and trial. So what is the process now that this, uh, this motion to dismiss has been denied? What's called discovery in America, that is the process by which documents and testimony are exchanged between the parties. Prince Andrew will be required to sit for a court-ordered interview on video where he will be questioned for up to seven hours of running time Prince Andrew has always denied the allegations. He's also said he does not recall ever meeting Virginia Dufresne. And while his side remained silent today, his accuser responded via her lawyers. They said, today's decision by Judge Kaplan denying Prince Andrew's efforts to dismiss Virginia Dufresne's case against him is another important step in Virginia's heroic and determined pursuit of justice as a survivor of sex trafficking. Buckingham Palace said today it would not comment on what it called an ongoing legal matter. But in the year, the Queen celebrates 70 years of reign. Right now, her son is heading towards a trial. Chris Hip News at 10. And our US correspondent, Emma Murphy, uh, is in New York. Emma, good evening. What uh, comes next? 
well, a whole load of trouble for the prince because he's going to have to sit for these depositions with David Boyce, who is Virginia Dufresne's lawyer, a man who is known in this city and indeed around the world as a real Rottweiler when it comes to these kind of interviews. He caught Ghislaine Maxwell out when she was giving a civil deposition and she ended up on criminal charges. So there is real jeopardy in those interviews. And then, of course, there is the disclosure statements where all the information relating to the time, be those diaries, security logs, phone logs, all have to be handed over to the team. Now, after that, Prince Andrew's legal team have a couple of options available to them. They could try and go for a settlement, but Virginia Dufresne says she's not after money, she's after justice. Then they have the option of doing a default where a trial goes ahead and just those depositions are used, not the prince in person. Or then I suppose the nuclear option is that they go to trial and the prince takes part in it. The legal team uh, for the prince, we think, might have one more stab at getting this thrown out on a technicality that Virginia Giuffre, although an American citizen, is currently living in Australia. It's going to be a long year ahead for the prince and the palace. OK, Emma, thank you very much indeed. Well, let's put all that um, to Chris, of course. No good options for the prince and all of them incredibly damaging for the royal family. Yeah, you just got to think about those three options that Emma outlined there. Settle, default, contest. If you're a member of the royal family, which of those is a good option? The answer to that is none. And as Emma was talking about, you know, potential deposition and being questioned by Virginia uh, Dufresne's lawyer, for seven hours, we saw what he did in one hour on Newsnight and that didn't turn out particularly well, uh, did it? And then the other options like settle or default given that she's someone who we don't think is of limited financial means, she might well demand something other than money. You know, I don't know, could that be an apology? Could it be something like that? All of the options are very damaging to a man whose reputation has already been very uh, damaged indeed. As for his side, they continue to say, I mean, they were silent today, but they've said to me before they will fight to clear his name. Yes, settlement's on the table, they say, but it's not an option that they're considering at the moment. Tom, you've got to think, what's the way back from this? He's taken this temporary step down uh, from royal duties. Rather feels tonight like it's a very permanent move indeed. And I can't see what way back he will have. OK, Chris, thank you very much indeed. Now, on a day in which COVID deaths reach nearly 400, the highest since last February and weekly infections topped 4.3 million, we are beginning a series examining the crunch issues in hospitals and indeed in acute care units. We've been to Chesterfield Royal Infirmary in Derbyshire, where the fight on the front line is made harder by staff shortages. COVID is responsible for three in five absences and all while the numbers of COVID patients are doubling almost every week. Diane, which comes to your observations, all right. Lindsay is checking on her patients, only they're not actually her patients because she doesn't usually work on this ward. So I normally work in education. You've been asked to staff this ward? I've volunteered to come down and help. Um, rather than see patients struggling, have no one to look after them, I'd rather be uh, supporting them and looking after them, making sure everybody's safe. In fact, this whole 16-bed ward at Chesterfield Royal Hospital has just been created to increase space. Because of pressures of COVID, our numbers are going up. It is, though, completely reliant on volunteers to staff it. This ward was open with about 12 hours' notice, possibly less, um, and so we're pulling from other wards. We review it on a daily basis and staff it as best we can. Um, some areas of the hospital are better staffed than others, but nowhere is fully staffed. Um, but we just have to balance the risk. Despite opening this ward, this hospital is still operating at capacity. And of course, yes, they could just open another ward, but the problem they always have is staff. Without the staff, they can't treat the extra patients. And those extra patients just keep on coming. In the emergency department, staff juggle beds while caring for patients waiting for a bed in other wards. I know, I'm really sorry. It's it's just so busy. Deborah's been waiting five hours. I just really need to go to a ward to get done Good what morning, I need to in do the next hour, energy. instead of making A and E busier than it already is. Mm. Charlotte's also having to deal with this while many of her colleagues are sick or isolating. Some days we have been five, six nurses short, healthcare short. The doctors have also been unwell, and so the workforce has been down. A third, sometimes more than that, on a single day. 
Downstairs, all planned operations have been cancelled. Only emergency surgery is taking place, but even that is hard to keep up. Have, have you got to the point where you just think, oh my gosh, we can't, we can't actually do all these patients today? So a couple of weeks ago, absolutely, because there were so many people off sick. People are trickling back now. Have you managed to keep it safe for them? So far, so far. Chesterfield is doing everything it can to look after both its patients and staff, but you have to ask how long can they work like this? Emily Morgan, News at 10 in Chesterfield. It is two months since the former captain of Yorkshire cricket, Azim Rafiq, stunned a committee of MPs and indeed the sport itself with his account of the racism he had been subjected to at the club. A new chairman, Lord Patel, was brought in to clear out the old guard to try to stamp out racism and to rebuild the club's reputation. As he told us today, he certainly thinks things are better than they were. Headingley, home of a once great cricket club, and a new chairman determined to make it great once more. We've done an enormous amount of work in the last eight weeks. Uh, we've taken this place and we've turned it upside down and give it a real shake and we're now putting the pieces back together again with a lot of independent help and scrutiny. Are you satisfied right now, Lord Patel, that Yorkshire County Cricket Club is no longer a racist place? The culture feels different in a matter of weeks. It's open, it's transparent, we're learning, we're engaging. You know, I've worked in lots of other institutions where I've not felt that comfortable. Still much to do then to recover from the devastating testimony of Azim Rafiq, a player who once captained Yorkshire, but who was driven, he said, from this club and this sport by racism. There's not many Azim Rafiqs in the world. There's not many people who would take that burden, and it is a burden to actually put themselves out there, take all the criticism and still go on to say, I want this to change for my kids. And, and the least I can do personally is to repay that by using this once in a lifetime moment to, to make changes, to this watershed moment. Out of 29 players in the current senior squad, there's only one of South Asian heritage, Adil Rashid. And in your academy, I mean, there's only 12 youngsters in the academy, but only two of them from South Asian heritage. It's almost unbelievable, those numbers, F it, for a county like Yorkshire, with cities like Leeds and Bradford and Sheffield. Yeah, I, I think it's culture, it's history, it's systemic, it's the way we've always done it. It's, it's never been challenged, it's never been thinking out of the box, it's never been, you know, looking beyond, you know, the obvious. Um, our scholarship programme that we're going to announce fairly soon is going to do exactly that. We're going to go to all the corners of Yorkshire and we're going to give every young boy, young girl a chance to show that talent and we're going to make sure we pick them and we pick them here. The chairman remains a proud Yorkshireman. His task now to give everyone who calls this county home reason to be proud of its cricket club. Geraint Vincent, News at 10. The tennis star Novak Djokovic today acknowledged an error of judgment. It's catching. The world number one was in training again today after revealing he took part in a photo shoot and interview in Serbia the day after he knew he tested positive for COVID. Now, finally, for those whose eyes sting when chopping onions, surely all of us, a development that could bring tears of happiness instead. For the first time, tear-free onions are about to go on sale in Britain. Yes, Really, they do taste a bit different in the US, where they have them already. They've been described by some food critics as too sweet or alternatively flavourless. Chef Sam Okafor knows his onions. He chops bags of them in his restaurant kitchen every day. But these ones are different. It didn't make me cry and um, it doesn't even feel like I'm cutting any onions, to be honest. And, uh, and uh, I mean, comparing to the one we're used to, by now, you should have seen me, you know. <laughs> yeah, water running down my eyes, but this one is quite, uh, it's quite fine. Meet Sonians, America's first tearless onion. They've been on sale in the US for four years, but it's taken decades of crossbreeding less pungent strains to develop them. Over three and a half decades, we have been working through natural selections of developing an onion that is both sweet, great to eat, and tearless. And so it really has been 
a long process with many people involved and a real labor of love for many of us who have been in the project. The onions might not make your eyes water, but the price could. At £1.50 for three, are they still worth it? What's that like? It's quite sweet. Is it? <laughs> it's so lovely. <laughs> You're eating that like a fruit. Mm, I can finish the whole plate. <laughs> so sweet. No tears here. And we'll find out if it's the ingredient everyone's been crying out for when it goes on sale next week. Yasmin Bottleby, News at 10, Leicester. Now I've seen literally everything. Good night. Thank you for watching.